All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming to our June Forum. Uh, it's a beautiful evening, I'm happy to say, and um, tonight we're going to be talking about recycling and all things new about recycling and uh, how we can be better at it. And as we all know, um, it's a very important thing. Um, we produce a lot of trash, each of us individually, whether we like to or not. And, um, you know, there's no place to put it, and even countries around the world are sending it back to us because we're really not good at um, processing it either. So um, what to do, and hopefully we'll all find out about uh, how we can do all of this better um, tonight. So I just want to, um, before we get started, uh, the Wellfleet Forum is here to um, have these types of forums to inform and engage uh, of our community on topics of importance and maybe deliberate and build consensus here as opposed to, you know, fighting it out on Facebook. So, um, but I do want to make an announcement that um, in July we are doing a uh, co-meeting. We are helping um, sponsor and get the word out for the non-resident taxpayer meeting. And that's going to be on July 18th here at, uh, the, at the council at 7, 7.30. That one will start, not at the usual 7 o'clock and probably to get people off the beach by July. And um, that is going to be Water Water Everywhere and uh, Executive Director of the Association to Preserve, uh, for the preser Preservation of Cape Cod, Andrew Gottlieb is going to come. He will moderate a panel on the state of Wellfleet's waters, especially the ponds, shellfishing beds, and Cape Cod Bay. Uh, Andrew is also one of the people who were involved in helping craft the um, room, room, well, the 208 plan, but also for when he was with the commission, with the county, and also um, the new room tax, much of which they're hoping towns will set aside to go towards environmental and water cleanup. So there's going to be a lot to learn uh, from that. Andrew was here over the winter at the library. It wasn't very well attended. But it was very informative, and I do hope that even though we may be year-round residents, we join with our non-resident taxpayers and uh, attend that. I think it's going to be very interesting. And then in um, August, we usually have our annual meeting and a potluck dinner. This uh, August, we're going to be partnering with the Shellfish Association so that we have a SPAT, we have the Shell Shellfish Association, we have the Shellfish Department. So how do these... Um, three entities sort of, uh, you know, collaborate and uh, interface and get things done. So there will be music. The Parkington sisters will be there. We will have our potluck, and there will be a brief annual meeting of officers. So if anybody's interested in uh, joining the board of the forum, um, please let us know. We would love to have you uh, as part of our group. So with all of that and uh, all of uh, that behind us, let me introduce tonight's program. We... We haven't got a date for August yet, but that will be coming out, so we will keep you posted. And by July, we will have that. Um, so to this evening, we are having uh, a presentation by Michael Sicali and Carrie Parcell. Parcell, thank you, because I just couldn't find her last name. Uh, and uh, uh, they will be talking about how we can do our part. So with that, I am going to hand this program over to them. They did say that you can ask questions along the way. They're not waiting you know, to give a presentation and afterwards. So if you have a question, they're happy to answer it as we move along. So with that, thank you. And I want to thank our guests tonight uh, for their hard work and our, our energy and recycling committee uh, for their hard work. And um, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Okay. So um, who thinks they're an expert recycler? Oh, this is huh? interesting. I love this. So you're actually going to learn something from me tonight. This is great. We're all going to have like a nice lesson. You're going to go home. You're going to know something, and then you're going to go tell your friends something that they didn't know, right? It's like the whole goal of this evening is to do our part, like recycle smart, and be better recyclers. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, as Sheila said, I'm Carrie Parcell. I work for the Department of um, Environmental Protection as well as Barnesville County. So I cover Barnesville County, Dukes, and Nantucket as well as the Elizabeth Islands, which are part of Dukes County. 
Um, so it's 23 municipalities in total. Um, I present all the time, all over. Um, I like having people here like Mike who operate the transfer station because every transfer station and every operation throughout the state does something completely different. And so not only is recycling really, really, really confusing, but then when you go to another town, it just adds to the mix. So Mike's gonna tell you something fun about flower pots that I would have been like, <laughs> and Mike's gonna go, yay! So, and that's because it's a Wellfleet specific thing that they allow that you to do based on the vendors that they choose. So first slide. Christine. Christine's going to be our slide monitor tonight since I'm over here. Um, also, we have prizes. I like to ask questions to the audience during my presentations, whether, you not, whether or not I've already said it out loud or whether I'm asking you a question. It just keeps you more engaged. It keeps you awake. It's either dinner time. You've already had dinner, so you're about ready to go to bed, like me. <laughs> um, so we have door prizes. We have eight, so I will try to keep it at eight questions to keep it fair. Um, because I don't want to ask nine and be like, sorry, I have a leftover pen. No? Jokes? Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about the bigger picture, kind of how the global markets affect us locally, sort of that trickle-down effect. And then Mike is going to be here to answer any specific questions. Uh, as Sheila said, I like to allow you to ask questions during presentations because it sort of lets you dictate the conversation instead of me dictating it to you. Um, and plus, I'm the kind of person that will think of something clever to say, and then I'll forget, and then I'll raise my hand, and then by the time somebody gets to me, I'm dumbfounded. So, with that, who has participated in the latex recycling program? Did, okay. did anyone drop off paint at the dump? Oh, there we go. That's there you go. You did, yes. See, this is why he's here. I'm like specifically like latex paint recycling. He's like, who just brings the paint to the dump? Well, okay. The, so the reason for that is because Wellfleet will accept paint all year, and we will sort it out and put it where it needs to go, whether we can recycle it through the grant or not. Uh, most towns have take back days, or like we used to have, if you remember, um, once every month or so. So now we take it all year long. So you might not even know you're recycling paint, but any paint you drop off. I'm going to use the mic. Mic with the uh, mic. If I or I'll move. Or I'll move. All right. Hi. Okay. So now that we're official, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Mike Sicali. I'm the foreman at the Wellfleet Transfer Station. Uh, I've been with Wellfleet for, it'll be five years in October, but I've been in and around transfer stations for 15 years professionally and grew up around drunk yards my whole life. So this was what I was born to do, I guess. <laughs> so anyways, um, the paint. Uh, if the paint is less than 10 years old in its original container and has never been frozen, I can actually ship that to a company called Recolor Paints in Hanover. And it's a women-run business, um, and they will recycle that paint into, I think, 15 or 18 different colors. Uh, yes. And we... And they have chalk paints now, too. Yes, they have chalk yeah, paints. Um, but the, uh, the cape got together, and through Phil Goddard of the town of Bourne, he applied for a grant, and the last two years we've been able to recycle that for free. So most of that paint that got diverted is at no cost to us. Um, the rest of it... But services have a cost, meaning <laughs> the state is paying yeah. for it. So don't think because it's free right now, it's free all the time to anyone. Right. There is somebody in the background paying for that service, just as a reminder for service. Yep. But one of the, one of the reasons um, that we were able to participate is because it was Cape-wide. And so there are a couple of drop-off points, Dennis being one, uh, Bourne being the other. Uh, so that made it easier for Recolor Paints to take this stuff back. They, were, they weren't going to come to Wellfleet for one box of paint. So things like that are stuff that we're doing. So without, you know, I don't want to take up all your presentation either. So there's the paint. <laughs> that's, that's, it's important. Hold on, let me grow a few feet. They do, and actually, Lydia, I called you a couple times today because they carry these little little samples, and I wanted to bring one just so you can kind of see it because the really cool thing about it is it's all virgin, so when they even do the color, um, they don't add any color to it. It's all done by, like, eye, and there's a color chemistry, and it's it's pretty fascinating process. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, they have a site in Yarmouth as well as in Falmouth, and it's called the Habitat for Humanity Restore that sells recolored paints. Um, but it is a women-owned business, like Mike had mentioned. Um, they've been around for a while. They just recently renamed themselves Recolor. 
Um, they used to be the paint exchange. So that's how we're um, getting rid of uh, latex paint. And as Mike explained, there's a, you know, we have to do it a certain way because certain things need to be a certain cleanliness and quality to be able to be recycled and to be recycled correctly. The next thing is uh, that Wellfleet is also participating in is the PGA, which is Process Glass Aggregate. How many of you guys have heard about this program going on in Dennis? Did anybody know that the ribbon cutting just happened? It's officially open. Mike was there. First, first in line. So first in line, uh, May 30th, they did a ribbon cutting. Uh, we had Representative Tim Whalen there. We had Julian Sear there. Uh, Brooke Nash of DEP was there who um, introduced this grant line to us that gave money to the, um, the town. Uh, my simple role was uh, you have land space and you're going to do this because as Mike would agree I probably boss him around a little bit and I'm like hey Mike you should do this and he's like okay um, and then he gets the powers to uh, agree so process glass aggregate I remembered Lydia um, this was in my living room for like the last six months uh, this is actually cut at a 3 8 minus this one particular uh, process glass aggregate comes from New Hampshire through a third party vendor so when the town of Dennis um, said, sure, we'll look into that. Uh, they got the grant, they partnered with NRRA, New England Resource Recovery Association, and now they are tipping glass in the town of Dennis as of May 30th, Wellfleet was first in line, and uh, that's gonna be processed into glass aggregate. Glass aggregate can be used for construction, highway building, and drainage programs. Um, so it's really cool, this is actual crushed glass, you can stick your hand in it, you can you know touch it. I'm gonna pass this around so that you can kind of uh, get to know what it looks like, um, but it's for it's it, you know it'll be full circle recycling because what happens is is the glass that's purchased and generated and used on the Cape will actually be tipped on the Cape, processed on the Cape, and reused on the Cape. Right? Exciting. Okay. Yeah, like no mirrors, no windshields, no, you know, candle jars. This is your basic recycling glass, like your pickle jars, your mayonnaise jars, uh, bottle bill glass, beverage glass, beverage container type glass. You know, some yogurts are being made in a glass now. That's fine. But yeah, n nothing that you wouldn't put in your glass container at the Wellfleet Transfer pretty, Station. Pretty much containers. Yep. There is a tipping fee to tip it, but I do not believe that there's a fee to take it back. It's tip a ton, take a ton. Yeah. So, so what's the cost? So, all right, if I'm gonna use the microphone, I'm gonna yell that again. So, um, for those of you that don't know, uh, our glass market dried up uh, about a year and a half ago. We got a letter stating that we have four days to get rid of whatever glass we have, and then you're done. And this is statewide. Uh, the one company that was taking it, um, they process it and they ship it to the one company that was making bottles out of it. The bottle company shut down overnight. So the processor had no market. The whole, the whole region pretty much had no glass market. So everybody was sitting on this stuff, trying to figure out what we were gonna do with it. And luckily for us, it was winter time and I had enough containers to keep a lot of it on hand. So this, this process has been a long time coming. But at the time, uh, maybe four months afterward, a company in Raynham opened up and had a glass crusher. And they wanted, I think, $85 a ton where we were making, and don't quote me on this, I think it was 25 a ton we were getting back, back years ago. So uh, it's also $500 to haul the glass with our vendor. So this is, we went from making some money to really spending a lot of money. This process, uh, I only have to drive the truck to Dennis, and I'm driving it, so there's no hauling costs. So we're saving $500 a haul. It's about 14 trips a year. And the tipping fee is, I want to say, $60 a ton. And so what they will do when they get enough glass in Dennis, they will call the crusher, make the PGA out of it. And uh, if they can't find a market or a use for it, then we will go down there and take every ton of glass that we shipped back to Wellfleet to use it in our projects. Uh, no cost on the take back. So, yes. Well, at the time, yes, because they were making new bottles out of it, but that company is no longer in existence. Yeah, yeah, so. So it worked out very well for the Cape. That was another Cape-wide initiative. Yes? What do you use it for, the aggregate? Uh, it can be used whenever you do like a drainage project or when you're putting like water lines in the ground and you need a bedding. Um, it's actually, yeah, highway construction, it's, it's very res uh, resilient to frost, 
which is nice. And then, of course, every ton of that we take back is one less ton of these materials that the DPW would normally buy for those projects. So it's a closed loop system, which is rare these days around here. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Um, so how many of you have ever heard of an anaerobic digester? Okay. Do you know that the town of Yarmouth applied for a grant for an anaerobic digester? Okay. So basically what that is, is it's a zero oxygenated digester. It's large scale. It's commercial. It takes in both food waste and wastewater sludge. Um, the way that they're looking at digesting it is in two separate ways because food waste produces a different end result as um, the wastewater uh, sludge does. Um, so that they're working on that. They did a feasibility study. They hired somebody. They put out an RFP, which is a request for a proposal. They gave it out to a certain vendor, and now they're continuing that feasibility study, as well as um, looking at this, the type of digestion that they want to do, whether or not they want to separate the two, and where the end markets will be and the feedstock that will come in. Because food, you know, food waste here on the Cape in the winter it could be a lot less than what it is in the summer. And so there might be a possibility of bringing in off Cape um, as well as maybe even from the islands because they're barging things in as it is. Uh, food waste drop off collection, that's exactly what you're seeing at the Wellfleet transfer station. We now have eight communities here in Barnesville County that's doing it. Uh, Wellfleet, Provincetown and Truro are all taking it to the town of Dennis. Again, Dennis kind of seems to be our regional hub. They're doing our latex paint for us. They're doing the PGA glass processing. And it's because they bug them because they have land space. Um, Mike got a little bit of bugging when I first started with some commercial composting because of their land space. Um, but commercial composting is really difficult. So it's a little bit more than, you know, me, po you know, poking. Uh, so that's kind of fun. It's cool. Have you guys used the, the food waste at the transfer station? Yeah, it's kind of fun. Uh, municipal bans. All right, first question, first raffle prize. True or false? All 15 towns of Barnesville County have a plastic ban bag. False. <coughs> All 15 towns of Barnesville County have a plastic bag ban. It's true. <laughs> Orleans, Orleans and Brewster were the last two to jump on the bandwagon. East Ham and Brewster just recently passed plastic bag bans. In the pink shirt, you may choose a raffle prize. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who's following the Cape Cod Times, CapeCod.com, Cape Cod Online? Uh, what's the other one's Cape Cod Chronicle? And <laughs> yes. Yeah, so basically you take these feedstock materials, food waste as well as wastewater management type sludge, and you digest it into an end market product that can create energy. So it's almost like the equivalent of a waste to energy facility where you're using trash. In this particular case, you're using food waste and the sludge from our wastewater to create that energy. And that sludge or that material that comes out afterwards is actually a product that can be used um, in agriculture and, and um, it's less expensive to ship off a more quality. Right now they're sending it to Maine, I believe, and it's expensive and it's low quality. So it's just creating energy and creating materials that have a higher quality, which means it's less expensive to get rid of. I mean, food waste can be anything from what your table scraps are into your compost bin to, you know, restaurant qualities to stop and shop, you know, fruit that goes bad, things that don't look pretty anymore, um, you know, restaurant clippings from like an orange peel, a banana peel to somebody not liking their meal and putting it in the trash. And it's not animal or, uh, it's, this does not include animal nope. products? Nope. Uh, I mean, you could have shellfish in there. Um, but no, there wouldn't be like, so the, I believe it's the state of New York that actually uses roadkill as compost. Um, and they do that in non-pedestrian areas for very obvious reasons. Um, but what they do is they bag it up and bale it out and they use it as like a soil amendment to create, you know, some sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like to create, you know, when you're like gardening and you need to make the soil stronger, that's what they use that stuff for, um, like bedding, um, but, but yeah, we wouldn't be using animal waste in this particular process. Not at the moment. Right now it's going to a farm called Watts Family Farm, and it's being composted, bagged, and sold to people who need compost. That's why we can take the meat and bones. And that is why you can take the meat and bones. And 
You can put it in anything you want. Just don't put whatever you are putting it in into the food bin. You just tip it right in. So um, you can use a plastic bag. Like I saw a lady in Barnstable like squeeze the plastic bag like a toothpaste tube. And then she took the plastic bag and threw it in the trash. She was a single person that kept her bag in the freezer until she was ready to take it to Barnstable. Okay? I would, I would add maybe grab a pan out of the swap shop and use that as your compost. Ah. All right. How many of you guys have boats here in Wellfleet? One boat owner? I like the reluctance, like maybe just me, <laughs> maybe just me. Um, anyway, have you guys heard that we have a boat shrink wrap recycling program? I want to see a show of hands. I don't want the yeses. I want to know you guys know this. And if you don't, you're going to go home and tell your friends and family. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we um, expanded that with uh, Sea Grant out of Woods Hole. Um, They're paying for it. Services are not free. Somebody is paying for it. But you, as a boat owner with a boat that originates on Cape Cod with boat shrink wrap, can actually take it for free to the towns of Bourne, Dennis. Hey, there's Dennis again. And uh, East Ham to be recycled. Um, and that's free for businesses, boat yards, and residents, as long as those boats are originating from Cape uh, so that's kind of a fun service. They were doing it with just one container, um, and then they called me, and they're like, hey, you know people. Can we make this bigger? And I said, sure. How big do you want it to be? They said, three towns big. And I said, okay, I'll give you three towns. So that's where it's going now. Um, so those are kind of the, I like to call it the state of the Cape. These are big things that are happening. I mean, recycling is extremely important at the basic level, but these are just kind of big, hard to recycle type items that it's difficult to get at your transfer station. Um, all of these things are happening in Wellfleet. Um, with the exception of the shrink wrap container, but the town of Wellfleet, the boat yards, marinas, and your you know, residents can go and recycle their shrink wrap. Next slide. Um, so this is just the bands. Um, so as you can see, when I put this table together, uh, there were two towns that had not yet passed a ban. Uh, so <laughs> nice work on saying, yes, everybody's doing it, because officially everybody's doing it, even if it's not implemented yet, because when they pass a ban, uh, you know, they allow folks who um, have the plastic bags uh, get rid of them. There's a window of time before they convert over um, and start encouraging people to bring reusable bags or putting in, you know, thicker plastic bags uh, or paper bags. Um, so next slide. Uh, so big question. Uh, this showed my naivety at a uh, tech council presentation. I thought the techie guys would know all this stuff. Uh, who's heard of the National Sword? I know Lydia can tell me what it is. Can you tell me what it is? Why? <laughs> Please pick a prize for at least knowing that. <laughs> anything, anything. All right, we're down to six. Yes, Sheila. It is. It's dirty. Woo! So the word that we like to use in the industry is contaminated. Um, I like to give you a visual picture of what contamination means because you guys have all heard the question or even might believe that our recycling goes into landfill. Don't lie to me. You all think it. Okay. So that's a, that's a primary question that we get is, well, doesn't it just go into the landfills or the waste energy facilities anyway? Doesn't it just get burned? And the answer can be yes. But there's a reason behind that answer, yes. And what happens is, is if you have a pretty recycling bin, okay, so I'm an expert recycler. That's my job, that's what I do, that's how I live, that's how I behave. And I have my, you know, my mayonnaise jar, my pickle jar, I have a to-go container that has, you know, the proper recycling, and I'll tell you how to find out whether or not something's recyclable in a few minutes. Um, I have, give me something else, um, my aluminum soup can, I've got, um, what else goes in the bin? Some mixed paper, some cardboard, some newspaper, and it's all in the bin. Okay, my Amazon boxes. And it's in a single stream bin, and I'm a curbside person. I'm not, I use a transfer station except for the dumper for, dumpster for my trash. And I put it on the curb, okay? It's pretty, it's beautiful, it's recycling. And then somebody walks by, and they put Barbie dolls, and trash, and food waste, and Christmas lights, and a car bumper, and garden hoses, and hangers, and some computers. All more yeah so there's a threshold of contamination so what happens is is my recycling is now trash with recyclables in it not recycling with trash in it does that make sense 
So therefore, that bin that used to be ready to go to the recycling market now belongs in a landfill because it's officially trash, because it hit that threshold of over 5% contamination. Does that make sense? Can we picture that? Okay. Um, so the ban with China is, is the reason why is the word contamination. We were basically sending them trash with some recycling in it, and those processors were digging through trash. And what happens is, is at port, the big companies that were starting the process were getting all the good stuff, the good stuff, and then it was trickling down to the families and the home processors and the people that you see sitting on these trash humps with their children and their newborn babies with the red rivers and with all the contamination and the sadness and the obvious poverty that they were living in, and it became this trickle-down effect, and the Chinese president said, no more. Did you guys hear my NPR thing, by the way? Anyway, Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what happened. So when you're, when you're talking to these processors and stuff, the higher people are cleaning up the trash, but then the rest of it's sort of trickling down, and then they're making pennies on the, you know, pennies during the day, just finding the, the scrap metal, the scrap plastics, the scrap aluminum, scrap glass, and it just, it was disgusting and quite disturbing. So that's why they put up this sort of embargo on enforcement for recycling. Uh, next slide. So these are just kind of some pictures. These are actually clean photos. So this is a clean paper right here. This is clean, this is nice, this looks good. You can tell it's all one material. It's all clean, it's not wet, it's not contaminated. There's no food in there, no baby diapers in there, no hoses and hangers and everything else. This is a nice clean plastic, although we don't like plastic bags, right? And the reason being is because of the way that we do it here in the state. Um, and then that's just what it looks like when it's going to port. From here to China, it takes three months. Do you guys know that? Three months. So when you go to your transfer station and visit Mike here, and you put it in the container, and then Mike takes it to a sorter, which we call a MRF, which we'll go into a little bit. Speaking of, another prize. Does anybody know what a MRF is or what it stands for? Besides the Solid Waste Recycling Committee? Because I've told them. Just kidding, I think they knew before I got there. So it's a materials recovery facility, and that's how our state source separates and processes our recycling into certain bales so that each material has its own bale and then can be sent out to market to be turned into the new materials. That's what it is, and I'll go over it a little bit better. Um, but anyway, so those are just some nice pictures. So when the National Sword put this big sort of um, embargo or enforcement restrictions, everything stopped because they were no longer taking our trash. And so it stopped at the international level, it stopped at the state level, it stopped at the national level. And this isn't just for America, it's all over the place that we're sending these. So it just stopped, 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 it hit the curb, it hit the transfer station, it hit the glass processing, it hit the haulers, and we all just stopped. And we had to respond to it. And again, this is how we're learning to clean up our recycling so that it's quality and no longer quantity. Does that kind of make sense? Awesome. Next slide. Um, so this is just the countdown. Usually my slides are not very wordy. I've already told you this stuff, so you don't need to hear it again unless you really want to. Um, I uh, have given this uh, presentation to the Wellfleet Recycling Committee, so if you want it, you may have it. Just contact Christine or myself. I bring cards um, in case you want to know how to contact me or Google me or find me somewhere in the internet land. Mike is the tall guy standing near the recycling center. <laughs> uh, next slide. Uh, so this is the material recovery facility, and this is why we do things certain ways, is because of how we process and sort and send out our materials to market. And this is why Mike is so important, because Wellfleet does it differently than Chatham, and Chatham does it differently than Provincetown, and Provincetown does it differently than Sandwich and Bourne and Falmouth and everywhere else, right? So when Mike says to me, like, hey, I got a question about flower pots, remember my answer before? I'd be like, no. He doesn't have a problem with it with the particular vendor that he takes. So that means Wellfleet can recycle your flower pots. And I'm going to tell every non-resident to go to you guys. No, I'm kidding. Um, but that's what it is. So it's pronounced MRF. It's a materials recovery facility. And that's what they do. They're just specialized plants. There's about nine of them throughout the state. And they're the ones that collect, sort, and bale and ship off to market. Those can, uh, do you want to go back one slide? Uh, one more. So those cargo containers to port is how that winds up over there. So those, those containers are full of baled recycling. Baled recyclables uh, weigh about 1,200 to 1,500 pounds, so just under a ton. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Christine. 
Next slide. So the way that we responded to it, yes. So with the flower pots, um, Carrie's going to talk about Recycle Smart and the state's universal list, which is what we're going by in Wellfleet. But uh, they don't have on that list a lot about bulky rigid plastic. Mm -hmm. And we have a bulky, bulky rigid plastic drop off. Our vendor takes it. Um, and I haven't been able to get a straight answer out of them, but we've been putting flower pots in there for a long time now. And so instead of putting them in the, with the plastic, which they don't want now, I'm having everybody put them in the, with, with the bulky rigid plastic until I can find out different. But again, we haven't had a problem yet. So for now, all quiet on the Western Front. Yeah, we're, we're doing that as well. They, they do not want those types of plastics in the recycling. And the other thing to think about with the garden stuff in particular is that if it's full of dirt, it's like Carrie was saying, you now have trash with recycling mixed in it. So it's you know, got to have what it clean. Analogy. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. So again, with the state's uh, recycling list, they said they don't want black plastic. And the story that I got was because at some of these sorting facilities, they're now using like optics to sort out the materials. And the black plastic looks like the conveyor belt. And so it will not get sorted out. Uh, however, again, with bulky rigid plastic, it's a little bit of a different process, different vendor. Um, but it's a little more uniform in the types of plastic that like your, your kids' playgrounds and five-gallon buckets and things are made out of. Those facilities uh, will be able to take those types of plastic. But again, I'm not, we're putting the flower pots in there. That could change, but I haven't heard any problems yet. So it's, at least it's a, an avenue to get rid of them. Yes? Well, I got a question that's like completely off the left field. Please. What pains me more than anything is when I go to the transfer station and I've got all this stuff that I've collected over my lifetime that I want to now get rid of. And I can't necessarily put it in. All I'm kind of recycling is so reductionistic, and yet we're a wealthy community. Our trash has got to be worth something. Our, our, our selected uh, treasures <laughs> of value to somebody, but there's no programs for that. So what type of treasures are you, are you talking about? Yeah, so, so the long and the short of this is that all of our waste is a product now. It's, it's, you have to find someone that wants this stuff. You also have to find a way to get it to them in a way that they want it. So with plastic bags, for example, you know, I even give you, I'll give you a styrofoam example. And this has really never worked anywhere around here that I can think of. But if I had a truck full of styrofoam, I could probably find somebody to take it, maybe not anywhere near here, but it would have to be just a truck full of styrofoam. So if you think about the diesel fuel required to take a truckload of styrofoam and the, weight, the actual weight of that styrofoam you're trying to recycle and the carbon footprint in level involved, it's not feasible. It's so things like, like, I guess you were saying like children's toys? Yeah, children's toys. <laughs> Children's toys are old. Here, here, like this. Cl uh, children's yeah. toys. Microphones, yeah. Microphones, <laughs> right. Old, old VCRs sure. or old electronics equipment. I mean, there's just so many things. Old pots, old, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you've had, I guess, um, many of us in a town like this have second, these were our second homes. And then, you know, consolidating these, we got all this stuff. You just sort of hate to fill it into a bag and throw it out. It, so I will, I will say uh, the Cape is pretty good about that. There have been a lot of places, and we have a lot of thrift shops. We have a lot of restores. We have the AIM. We have swap shops. We have big-time yard sales, especially Memorial Day weekend. So we actually have a lot of avenues to get rid of that stuff. But it is not as probably as convenient as you'd want. But uh, I think overall, it, again, it's, you can either resell this stuff to your friends and neighbors or you really have to find a market for it. And if the market's not there, I can't do anything with it. I would just like to point out. 
Um, I just want to put out that I use, uh, there's something called FreeCycle, which is an email list. There's also the Wellfleet Community Facebook page. Oh, sir. Uh, the Wellfleet Community um, Facebook page where you just put stuff up for free and people, we've had pro a lot of things when combining <laughs> households. Um, having people come and take furniture that's not pristine and you can't get to the swap shop. I would like to take a moment too to just give Mike a lot of credit here. Um, you guys are one of my favorite transfer stations, so please applause right now for him. Thank you. Um, he really takes any ideas or concepts that I present to the town, whether or not they choose to use it, and runs with it and makes it their own. Instead of being like, well, this doesn't work for us because this is different, he makes it work for the town. So when you go into your transfer station and you see, you know, the 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 sort of uh, what are those things called the shadow box of do not recycle and the recycle smart MA signs and the universal signage that's image based, really easy to look at, really easy to follow. It's Mike. It's me saying, hey, these are your valued resources. This is the collateral. This is what you can use. And some transfer stations are, you know, not mine per se because the Cape and Islands love me, but. Mike does a really, really nice job at doing this stuff, and I'm constantly texting him, asking him for photos so I can share, because other people need to see that just because it doesn't fit for you doesn't mean you can't make it work for you, and that's exactly what Mike does, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, <clears throat> when you're, asking a, when you're making a, asking a question or saying something, you've got to hear yourself. If you don't hear yourself, we can't. Um, I have family in other Cape Towns, a lot of other Cape Towns, it would really be nice going forward if there was a uniform, every dump was the same, every recycling center was the same. I am working on that avidly right I now. I my grandmother, you can't take this to, yes. and I can't do anything with it because you live in Marston's Mills. Yep. I am working on that, and again, with Mike and my praise to him, he's one of the first people to pick up those types of concepts, so that this is why I bug him all the time, is so I can send these images to other towns and show them how well it works. So that's exactly, and hopefully, you know, and towns are working on it, Barnstable, Brewster, Yarmouth, Chatham, they, they all have the same signs as Wellfleet does, so we just need to continue getting the towns to adopt it, but that's what we're working on. Um, I just want to say that um, Mike not only does a really good job at the transfer station, but he's always looking at the cost effectiveness of, of how to do this. And from the town standpoint, um, that's really admirable for anybody that's working uh, for the town to be looking at cost. Um, the other thing I want to say is the, that shadow box that you mentioned. People should really take a look at that because it's a work of art. It's a, a, a collage. It's a... Uh, uh, it's it's a work of art. Um, Carrie, is there a municipality, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, or town on the Cape um, that's doing this, um, you know, to the nth degree that we could set a standard with? Or do you feel that there's somebody doing it better than we are? <laughs> I, I, I only have the headspace for the Cape and Islands. When somebody says, oh, what is Natick doing? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. So as far as what my district is doing, um, I think we can all learn from each other. I think there's something somewhere that somebody's doing better in a particular thing here and there. But again, I want to preface that I talk to Mike all the time. And it's not so much me talking to him about, like, you could do this or you should do this or, you know, shoulda, woulda, coulda. I'm always going to him saying, you know, I really need a photo of this. Or can I really share this? Or do you mind if I do this? So, I mean, there's, you know, there's towns that are doing very well. But there's also towns that are doing very well. But they're also progressive and reciprocate. You know, they, they, they receive information and they send it out very well. And that would be the town of Wolfleet. No, no, no. So thank you, Kathleen. That was very nice. Uh, but uh, I think there are things that we could do, but it's it's a matter of time, money, effort, infrastructure, you know, uh, and also the recycling market right now. If when this recycling craziness all happened, if we had been a source separated town, uh, almost similar to East Ham, where they separate every little thing, we would be in a better position. If we had gone to single, single stream recycling, we would have been in a much worse position. When this uh, recycling crash happened, the state told us all, don't change anything until this gets sorted out. 
And we're kind of, as far as I know, we're kind of still there. So there's a chance that things could change. We could separate more, we might separate less. It depends on the infrastructure that the, the country really is gonna have to come up with in order to deal with this. So for right now, we're kind of leaving that alone, unless I find out something better. Yes. I'm confused about what you're trying to standardize because is it this, if it's the signage, um, how does that relate to the fact that the towns are all using different vendors who have different policies about what they'll take? So, I don't so the, some vendors have different policies, but it, like our, our vendor that I use for the recycling, they were kind of a MRF. They've kind of transitioned into more of a trucking company for us anyway. So they find other MRFs. They find better markets, whatever the best price is, and that's where they go. So it opens up a little bit more markets for us. But as far as what can go in the recycling bin, that's statewide now. So the signs that I have up there, I've combined them because Wellfleet is dual stream. But the paper sign, the plastic sign, the, you know, the glass sign, those are all those universal signs that the state came out with. So if you live in Cambridge, you should eventually see the same sign as you do in Wellfleet for glass. Um, the difference being the cleaner the recycling is, the more people want it and the less money we'll have to pay to get rid of it. So our system right now is, is pretty good if you compare it to something like single stream. But until, again, the infrastructure of these recycling facilities, these MRFs, kind of figures out what is the best way to go, we're, we don't want to change anything right now because it costs a lot of money. I have to try to convince all of you fine folks to put things in a different bin than you're used to. And that, I don't want to do that too many times if I can help it. Um, it's going to change over yeah. and over and over again. So that's why the state said, do what you're doing. Let's just clean up what you're already doing. Yep, so that's where we're at. And that's, that's going to leave me, I'm going to take an opportunity to ask a question. How, are, how will we, the public, know what is going to be your form of getting that word out when changes do occur? I know that we have an active recycling, recycling committee, but is there, is, I mean, you know, we could help disseminate that. Um, are you something you'd put forward to the chamber to put out to people? And yep. you'll use all those... So the state relies heavily on transfer station staff, folks like me, recycling committees, to be really active and to, to put out these changes. Um, if you want to skip, see, this is why I like questions now, because you don't need to hear this if you're more curious about this other stuff. Uh, if you just want to go to the Recycle Smart MA. Okay, so something like this is something that the state put out. Uh, Recycle Smart came out in August of 2018, and it's, it's basically a universal list. Now, the list isn't being released to the public because it's too long, it's too confusing, and it's going to change over and over again. And if you don't like how complicated it is now, then you really don't want a big list that you're going to have to look at over and over again every time you go to the recycling center. So there's cards like this, and again, this is you know sort of Mike's doing, where they've got the infographic. Chris, Chris, Chris thank you. Um, so this is Recycle Smart MA. This is their infographic. So if you were to go online and type in RecycleSmartMA.org, there's this infographic, this card. And the way that Wellfleet did it was they added their own information, which we encourage, right? Because Wellfleet does it different than somewhere else. And then it's also something about like the bulky rigid plastics or the gardening uh, containers that you talk about and how to dispose of that because that's a hard to recycle material. And then other things. And so again, Mike took this and ran with it. He changed the card. He developed it. He changed it to fit. Oh, Chris. Uh, Chris, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chris did all the graphics to do this, working with Mike and the recycling committee to make sure that the information was accurate. So she beautified it, made it this way, and then Mike turned around and put up, you know, the shadow box and the signs and everything else that, you know, that he saw fit. So it's, it's really sort of a, it's a statewide program telling you what you can recycle and what you can use um, and where you can put it, but it's also, you know, town dependent because we have, what, 351 towns in the Commonwealth and we're all kind of doing things differently. What's the shadow box? Want to describe the shadow box? <laughs> so uh, over the past few years I've been working at the transfer station, I've tried many different things, different signs, different ways of approach, different whatever. And so I decided after this, it was a, such a drastic change that people like visuals. So I started taking the stuff that the recycling companies didn't want to see, and I just tacked it all to a board and said, this can't go in. And then I put the website up and, and all that. And people seem to have been responding to that really well. Um, and also, Wellfleet's unique in the sense that our recycling compactors are really small for the 
people we serve. So I have to have staff there all the time to run them. So we're always there to ask questions or monitor or anything like that. So just even if you have something outside of this forum, like I'm, al we're always up there. So please ask questions and uh, we'll give you the, the latest and greatest up-to-date information. I think I've asked you this at the transfer station before, but I want to be really good at this. So it, effectively, we don't pay attention to those numbers. All right. So, so it's, yeah, it's my understanding that the numbers in indicate what the type of plastic is. But where our municipal recycling kind of comes in is what that has been made into. So plastic bags are very recyclable. But when you put them in with all of your containers and you bring them to one of these sorting facilities, it's a nightmare for them. And so you have to find a vendor that wants just plastic bags. You can't mix things like that. Um, I know the supermarkets are taking them. I'm working on something uh, with the supermarkets so that we can have the same type of bins available. Um, but then again, plastic bags are illegal in Wellfleet, so I shouldn't see any of them. So wow. question, since Mike has the mic, so I'll let him ask. He probably can't hear me. Is for, for a, a door prize, Based on kind of what we've already talked about, why wouldn't plastic bags go in your recycling bin, but they can be recycled elsewhere? Because they jam up the machine. Yeah. You can pick something out, sir. Awesome. Uh, I was going to ask that, and then Mike's like, yeah, you can take it to your grocery store. Mickey just totally ruined the question. No, I'm just kidding. He's too good. He's too good. So I kind of wanted to go back to your question here about how Wellfleet's doing. Talk about this real quick. So I'm going to give you guys a little secret that I'm probably sharing with anybody that's going to watch a video or go home and talk. Uh, so we like to call this the map of shame or the map of pride. And it really depends on what color you are. And I'm going to go ahead and give a couple of these reds a little bit of a kickback saying that Chatham and Provincetown really aren't this red. They just gave me misinformation, which then got relayed to the state, and they became red. This is how much trash do we throw out based on residential trash. So there's commercial trash coming from businesses and haulers and complexes and apartments and condos, and then there's trash that's residential or municipal. This is only supposed to be municipal trash. Wellfleet is this pretty, pretty, pretty green color right up here, which means that per household, uh, 750 pounds or less of trash is being put into the municipal program. So that's a really, really, really low number. Um, and the reason being, obviously, is things like we care, we work hard, we have people like our Solid Waste Recycling Committee and our transfer stations getting out the information. Um, I can only do so much going from the state and the county, so again, we rely heavily on the boots on the ground folks to actually relay this information to you. Um, but what really happens is, is when you're green like this, you're doing more recycling, you're doing more composting, you're doing more reuse, you're putting on fix-it clinics, um, you're putting on amnesty days, you're, you're accepting latex paint year-round. So you're doing all of these things that prevent things from going into the trash. So that's exactly why you guys are green. Yeah. You, you couldn't hear that? I, I heard you, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, so what are we, are we just better citizens or is our, is our program better? <laughs> I'm going to let you tell the citizens of the other towns that question. Oh. No, so again, with, yeah, there's a ton of things that go into this, um, but the reason why Provincetown is red is because they gave me commercial and residential numbers, and so by the time it made it to the map, it was too late to change. So that's actually a missed information. They should be a lot greener on here. Uh, churro. Um, they're single stream and they uh, collect public space recycling at the municipal level So there's a lot more commercial and business trash that goes into it That could be a factor to why they're like not doing as well as you do Wellfleet doesn't really take a lot of commercial trash at the transfer station. So their numbers are more accurate um, And that's what kind of makes this map a little, you know but we'll take it. Yeah, I mean <laughs> You know, but, but really what you're relaying to us, the Department of Environmental Protection, is that you're doing an excellent job. That's what these numbers relay to us. They're fairly accurate because there's not a lot of commercial business trash that's going into it. You have Mike giving me the numbers. You're not talking about anything going over a scale. So it's pretty accurate. Okay, cool. excuse me, Lois, had, oh, you're all set? Okay. Great. Uh, the reason we're asking you to use mics so the TV audience can hear it. Yes. We know you can hear fine in here, but we need to So I'm going to let home. Christine, because Christine did have her hand, then Mo, and then Jane. 
This is a quick one, but I just wanted to ask, doesn't if pay and throw, uh, pay as you throw, <laughs> significantly reduce the amount of trash? Yeah, we like to call it smart, save money and reduce trash. And the way that I like to look at pay as you throw is like a utility. And utilities are things like gas, water, heat, electric, and we pay for what we use. And it kind of makes sense with a trash service because we should pay for what we use. And I know there's a lot of arguments against it and there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, but basically when you switch to a pay as you throw, what happens is, is your trash goes down about 50% and your recycling goes up 30%. And you would ask, well, why wouldn't the recycling go up parallel to a trash? Uh, going down and the reason being is there's about 14 to 15 reasons why and this is exactly why you guys are green because you're composting which is removing food waste it's because you're reusing and having fix it clinics and swap shops and amnesty days so by diverting that trash not only into the recycling because if we remember that recycling it's reduce reuse and recycle we should think of recycling as the last resort before the trash can not hey we recycle so we're doing the right thing it's about thinking of other ways to repurpose and refurbish and reuse and reduce what we're already doing so yes recycling is great and we want to talk about it and we want to do our part and recycle smart and be a better recycler right that's why we're all here but that's really not where we should be starting the conversation it's really sort of can I, you know, we've, we've gone through everything else. Can I reuse? Can I reduce? Can I do this? Before we think recycle, nope, trash. And that's what you guys are doing. That's why you're green. And pay as your throw is part of that. Yes, my, my question is here on this thing, on this card, it says no clothing or linens. Mm -hmm. But you have a poster up there which says you can recycle textiles. So exactly, that's an excellent question, Jane. So exactly like your plastic bags, which this <laughs> Bruins fan over here who's anxious to watch the puck drop, um, game four, go bees, um, is he, you know, when you take a plastic bag and you put it through the um, uh, conveyor belts and the optics and the mechanics of our sorting facilities, it gums it all up. Um, if you think of a textile like a clothing or a pillowcase or a towel, it's going to do the exact same thing. So it's recyclable. It's just not recycling in your bin. It has to go to a separate material stream and be collected by a different vendor to be taken to a different place to be re reused in things like your chair cushions, other clothings, you know, uh, the, the dashboard filler in your vehicles, um, you know, upholstered furniture, that sort of thing. So it's a recyclable material. It's just not something that would go into your bin to go into the sorting facility. This, well, this, this relates to the green compact. That's what this really is. It's, you know, we have we have a lot of things that we can recycle now separately. Oh, sorry. sorry. Oh. So um, this chart was what was once known as like your basic recycling. And this is what the green compactors that I have at the transfer station are for. And that's why you have things like no clothing, no plastic bags, no food, no tanglers, even though I have other places that I can recycle clothing and electronics and food. Yeah. So this is, again, the state came out with this. So this is for the entire state, and some of those communities don't offer all that. Some of them are curbside, and they definitely don't offer that. So this is basically just for those green bins. And if you have anything on that sign that says no, ask me, and you never know. We maybe we will have some place to put it. So. That's, that's a wonderful thing. Are there any other questions? I have one question, and it was actually posted on Facebook. Uh, someone asked, where I won't be able to get there tonight. Where will I be able to get the card, where will these this information be available around town for people to get? Yep. So the Wellfleet Recycling Committee, the transfer station website, as well as RecycleMA.org, or they can certainly call me anytime they want and ask specific questions. Um, I think if it's Wellfleet specific versus global or state or um, I think Mike has a lot of information on, you know, latex paint and boat shrink wrap because I fill these guys in so when they get those questions, they can tell the folks that are visiting your transfer station, oh, you have boat shrink wrap, which we don't take here unless you want to throw it in the trash. But on this day, this day, this day, you can take it to one of these, you know, one of these three towns through June 30th, and it's free for you. No, the service is not free, but it's free for you. Somebody else is paying for it. So if next year we charge you, I'm not saying we're going to, but I'm saying if these things change, it's because the cost increases and there's not somebody there behind the scenes paying for that service. I saw a hand. Say one, one more thing. Oh. For just because the website came up, I have to address this because my poor recycling committee has been waiting for a year now for the website to change. Um, I did create an entire new website. I went to get approval. It got approved. I went to put it up, and the town changed servers, and I had to wait a couple of weeks. And now everything I made doesn't necessarily switch over. 
but I have been working on it. I finally have access to it. I started changing a few things, and I'm hoping that that will alleviate a lot of things. But uh, the, the website right now is not the best, so I apologize for that. But we'll get there real soon. Yes. So where do we get the card, the actual card? So RecycleSmartMA.org. There's an infographic. And then the recycling committee kindly printed you some out. Um, so you can put it on your refrigerator or keep it with you. Um, but if you print it off of the, um, uh, the uh, Recycle Smart MA, you'll get this front page here. And you just tape it right up to your... Um, if we had internet here, I could show you the recycling widget, which Mike brought up earlier. So if you go to this website, you're not just going to see this piece of information. There's actually a bar that we call the Recyclepedia. Has anybody used that yet? Yeah, a few people. So what you... Since I don't know you, but I know everybody else because I told them about it, I'm going to let you go ahead. Oh, it's Lonnie. You're just incognito. Never mind. You're the recycling committee. You can't raise your hand. I want a stranger. I don't recognize to say I've used it. I know you've used it. I was like, wait a minute. She's all incognito with the hat on. Take that back. You can't have anything. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's a... Um, it's. I have a question. Is is the boat shrink wrap a specific plastic like what books come in? Uh, basically, it's a number six, and they take white. White boat shrink wrap. No, they wouldn't take that. Although you could take that um, in its clean form to where you would take your plastic bags at a grocery store, as well as like the plastic wrap that goes around your toilet paper, the newspaper bags, the produce bags. Um, other plastic film can go there, too, as long as it's clean, a.k.a. there's no food waste or there's nothing else attached to it. I have one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. So, so um, when I sometimes I take my uh, plastic or whatever and I have it in a plastic bag and I dump it all in and then there's a bin there for me to put my plastic bag into. So can we use those for plastic bags that we have, like for um, you know bread, our bread bags, our uh, whatever? So. You know. Yeah, so this, this is an excellent question. The blue bins next to the plastic compactors that say plastic bags here, please. So a few, maybe almost three years ago now, uh, when we switched vendors, and this was before all of this happened, um, we asked the vendor, hey, you know, a lot of people like to put their plastic in plastic bags. Plastic is plastic, right? And they said, yeah, we don't care. Great. So we told everyone, yeah, go ahead. It's easy. You know, it makes it, you know, whatever. Well, about maybe less than a year after that, wherever they were bringing this plastic to, told them, that we don't want this stuff if it's full of plastic bags. So they told me, we got to keep the plastic bags out. I'm like, are you kidding me? I just, you know, so I hate doing this to you guys, just so you know. I really try to make sure that whatever I put into place is going to stick for a while. Um, but this was one of those situations. And so because everyone put their plastic in plastic bags, I just put that out there. And instead of saying trash, because it would just fill up instantly, I just said, Put the plastic bags here. So the interesting thing to your question is that now two years later, um, with trying to keep the recycling clean and everything, uh, I, I called the supermarkets and I just asked them. I said, hey, I'm a municipal transfer station. I'll probably have four or maybe in the summertime eight bags of bags every week if I choose to collect them the way you do. Is this something you would take? And they said, yeah. So um, again, being way up here in Wellfleet, you're not going to find a plastic bag recycler that's going to come all the way up here for four bags. However, we have a Shaw's in Orleans and a Stop and Shop, and I have to bring the food waste to Dennis once in a while anyway. So on my way down, my plan is going to be to bring the plastic bags to the supermarkets so that you guys don't have to do it because you're already putting them in the bins now. Um, the, the, the hold up on that, <laughs> thank you. The hold up on that is uh, I've got the signs made. I just got to put them out. It's again a matter of time, staff, you know, just it, these things take time. But that's going to come. And uh, on that note, when that does happen, it does mean that those blue bins are going to be just for plastic bags and not styrofoam and not anything full of food or not anything like that. But this, there'll be a sign written right on the bin. And again, please ask questions. So we're always up there. Thank you. I, this is not a question. I just wanted to share some research that I've been doing uh, in a casual way in the supermarkets, and it goes to plastic and plastic. Though the supermarkets have eliminated the plastic carrier bags, they do have the flimsy little ones for putting the produce in. And I've 
been trying to avoid using them, and I was wondering if it was going to make it more difficult for the cashiers. So I've asked every cashier, do you mind? And the answer is no, they don't, because they don't have to pick them up. They just roll them on the thing. So if you've got apples or oranges, obviously I'm not talking about cherries or anything like that, but <laughs> Why a not? lot of produce okay. that you buy, you do not have to put it. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just telling you, you don't have to put your produce in the little plastic things for yourself or for the convenience of the cashier. They think it's fine. Yeah. And I, I, I will off. You know, I will springboard off of that statement. I am that jerk that has every single thing on the conveyor belt. Not cherries, but um, when I, I don't use plastic bags, and I used to be like a stickler about putting my meats in the plastic bags because heaven forbid it touched anything. But um, I've sort of stopped eating meat, so that's not a problem anymore. <laughs> However, um, it's, it's fine because I go home and I wash it anyway. So all my stuff, even my green onions where it just seems kind of gross, you know, you just go home and you clean it up. So, and the, the cashiers really don't mind. They really don't. They're just sticking it in your, in, in your reusable bags anyway. Kara, you're great. You talk really fast. <laughs> So can you back up to, you started talking about things they will take at the supermarket outside the plastic. What, what plastic wrap stuff will they take? Right. So in addition to a plastic bag that are now banned here, um, you can do things like the, like a toilet, you know, when you buy toilet paper, it comes in the plastic. Um, the little newspaper sleeves as well as your produce sleeves can go in there as well. Um, other film plastic, uh, like, uh, what's the TerraCycle? It's, uh, yeah, there's a fire right over there. But basically that can be included in with it um, because it's, it's clean. As long as it's clean, it's okay to go in there as well. Um, so trivia question, and for the sake of time, because the bees are playing tonight, um, <laughs> but I want you guys to ask all your questions. Um, and they, there's one, there's five things left over there, I see. Um, do you, does anybody know what that plastic film wrap, boat shrink wrap, plastic bags get turned into? You should know, Christine. Oh, what? Huh? Yes! Whoever said that? Prize! Okay. What was it? What was it? <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, outed. Okay, outed. Bonus, bonus question for the expert. <laughs> Can plastic decking be recycled? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> you sure they can? I don't know. No, I they so. can't. I think, plastic, I think decking is end, end game. The all weather decking is meant to have a lifelong warranty, so that's sort of a trick question, Mike. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's supposed to last forever. It's a really long uh, warranty. But yes, um, when you have plastic decking, it's considered a bulky rigid, and I'm sure they will find a way to turn it into a speed bump uh, on the streets like they do with some other bulky rigid plastics. So yes, it can be repurposed. Here's a trick question. What do you do with nuclear wait, wait. What, do you, what do you do with nuclear waste? Yeah. That's a big, a big problem. Do you have any? A big problem here. We, we have a ton of it. Yeah, that's another group. Yeah, here yeah. in the neighborhood. That's our hazardous I waste really person. Hazardous waste because it was this Saturday. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to Truro next month. I heard you have to stockpile it for a while, like Pilgrim's doing. Uh, that's not in my wheelhouse, although I, I, one day that I'm bored, uh, I'll look it up. Um, it's what? Is it? That's the shelf. Half a million years. Mm hmm. <sighs> okay, uh, new trivia question. So, National Sword was an enforcement of what? The removal of what? What's the word? Contamination. Okay. <laughs> she <the> microphone. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not on the recycle committee, but yeah, no, you're not on the oh, committee. I, I you can. I gotta go. You can come. Okay. We're getting rid of prizes now. What are the swap shop hours of operation? Oh, there's okay, some. Wait, I, all right. Eight to, okay. I think I saw that one over there. You don't there. have enough cups. Yes. What was it? Eight, is it? Eight to 12. Eight to 12. Okay. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. If you want to answer. First hand up was over here. I think so, yes. Yeah. Eight to 12, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Tuesday. 
Perfect. Thank you. you get a, okay. I like it. Um, you think of wealth gates as a big one. See, I've got general ones. Yeah, I'm there a lot. Um, um, what is the website with the Recyclopedia on it? I'm going to give you a hint. Recycle. Mass. Keep going. <laughs> Recycle Smart. Recycle Smart MA. MA.org. You're close enough. <laughs> Please. I know I should have brought that picture of it. Um, I was going to say take a picture of the signs at the dump. All right. Why, out of 14 reasons, about five I listed, does pay as you throw work? Raise your hand if you're talking. So I can't see you. Oh, the recycling, oh, recycling committee married guy. Okay. <laughs> reduces recycling, or reduces landfill and increases recycling. Exactly. Do you remember the numbers that I gave you? 50% reduction for landfill and 30% increase in recycling. Well, nice. 30, 30, 45. Well, you're a good listener. That's a very good listener. All right, this is more of a theoretical. We've got three things up there. I want somebody to raise their hand with what they're going to go home and tell either a family member or a friend to shock them about what you didn't know about tonight. <laughs> That's a good one. I did not even hear that, but the giggles were awesome. Oh, thank you. I definitely think you should take two. Mike wasn't even job. wearing a hat, if you can believe it. Yes. Okay, Richard. Yes, at home I don't recycle meat and bones. Why does uh, the farm, Watts Family Farm, take that? Because they can recycle it? Mm -hmm. uh, so their compost facility can manage it, and because they can manage it, they can do it. Oh, sorry. We're both going to get yelled at now. <laughs> uh, because the vendor that they're using, the farm that the food waste goes to, can manage it. So they, therefore, they can take it. Yeah. I have something that you could tell them now that will shock them, and they'll all tell their friends, which when we had lunch, you shared how many bags of trash you, as an individual, <laughs> produce a year. <laughs> Gosh. Did I say six? Because I feel like it's about six bags of trash let me preface it. I am one person, and I am an expert at this stuff. So even if I do not have the answer, I do. But I, give, I probably throw away a small bag of trash maybe every six to eight weeks. Very good. <laughs> now the wine bottles. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Are milk cartons still allowed? in the paper trash? So the jug ones are, right, Mike? The plastic jug ones. The plastic jug ones are, but the ones that are made of like the Terra Pack that you see like almond milk and orange juice and like the soup ones are not supposed to go in the recycling any longer. That is one of the new rules that the state had worked out with the MRFs and the MRFs sort of made this list with the state um, because they're considered a nuisance item. And so what happens is it's because they're waxy during the melting down process with the rest of the paper, cardboard, and newspaper. It just gums it up, and it just makes for a big mess. So they prefer that you don't. It is. I would say, uh, if you don't mind. No, not at all. I would say an easy way to remember it is any paper product that once contained a liquid is trash. Oh, that's a good way to say it. Mm -hmm. There you go. Sorry. Here, Are there any? A, okay, Harold. Yeah. Um, we have a wood stove which we use for heat a fair amount, and I have burned a ton of newspaper, like reusing. That's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your take on that is that's a good a good use of newspapers is to yeah or composting and turning the ash into the compost as well. Yeah. Yep. You may have so, an avenue for your radioactive waste. <laughs> <laughs> so so that so the pollution of that is not as an offsetting factor is not a concern of yours? I, I mean, off the top of my head, making smoke over recycling, I don't know. But yeah, there's a study to be done there for sure. And, and it depends on how far away you need to get that newspaper in order to recycle it and what that facility is going to generate for power versus just yeah. burning it. 
Um, one of the questions, I guess I should use the mic. Yeah. I'm going to get yelled at. One of the questions I get all the time is, uh, shouldn't we just throw it in the trash? It's cheaper. Sure, go ahead. And then tomorrow the state will shut us down because that's against all the laws. So you don't even have that type of option. So the thing to do is when you're uh, talking about if it's worth it or not, it's the newspaper kind of has to go in the newspaper bin because there's these waistbands and there's a sign right on the trash trailer that has all the waistbands on there. And so these aren't things that Wellfleet makes up. These are things that are statewide. Um, so, I mean, if you want to start fires with newspaper, that's, you know, there's not going to be anybody busting down your door. But the fact is, I have to put the newspapers in the newspaper bin, regardless of what that costs right now. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to, I saw Jane first. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering then, are we not supposed to put newspapers in our paper trash, in our paper recycling? All right, let me, <laughs> sorry, we know we still have mixed paper in Wellfleet, so your newspapers would just go in the paper, with mixed paper with the cardboard, yes. Yep, and then. So question, yes. what is commercial food? Commercial food, I think, would be anything generated at a restaurant, and I think usually it's, what, about one to two tons per week? One uh, ton per week. So why is that banned? That is banned from the trash. Oh. Because uh, MS, uh, tr food waste is 23% of all the MSW in the state. So, uh, welcome to my world. <laughs> There's another, uh, question here. Yes. Um, Carrie or Mike, could you talk a little bit more about the recyclopedia? Because I, I have found that really helpful, and you haven't talked about it that much. Oh, yeah. So, um, so when you go on to RecycleSmartMA.org, uh, your homepage at the very top will have a bar. And it's called the Recyclopedia. And you would go in there and you would type in the item that you're curious about, whether it's a chrome metal bumper, whether it's a Dunkin' Donuts cup, whether it's a shoe, um, pair of glasses. There's a huge list of over 400 items, I believe. And when you type it in, it's going to tell you if it's recyclable and if it is, where. So do we put our textiles in with the basic recycling, according to Mike? No. No, we take it somewhere else, but it is recyclable. So that website will actually say yes, but put it here, not there. Um, if it's pure trash, like the black plastic that somebody brought up, then it would go into the trash, and it's going to say that. Um, and if it's something that is recyclable, like a basic, like if I type in you know, glass pickle jar, then it's going to say yes, you can put it in your glass bin. So it's a really, really, really easy, convenient way to do it. Um, it does mean that you have access to the internet, so it's limiting in that way. It does mean that you have to remember the website, which is limiting in some capacity. But it is a really great universal statewide list of items that are acceptable at either the curb, at your transfer station, or in other bins like your books with Discover Books or your textiles or um, your food waste with the farm that the, the town of Wellfleet uses. So, so I compost my food but not meat or bones. So when we're scraping off a plate, I'm looking at this commercial food thing, at the end of a meal, I would put the vegetables into the compost and the bones into the, my purple bag, trash. Mm -hmm. you, you're saying that's not allowed in the trash? Okay, so let me, that, that was really good to point out what commercial waste, uh, food waste is. So commercial food waste is, it's basically defined as a generator of one ton or more per week. So that's not a household. No household, I hope no household, <laughs> generates a ton of food waste per week. Commercial is what would go into a Yarmouth anaerobic digester if and when it is built. It is a huge amount of food waste coming out of hospitals, institutions, restaurants, resorts, schools, that sort of thing. At home, you can put your food waste and your meat into the bin that goes to the Wellfleet transfer station. If you're a home composter, like I used to be when I had land, when I was living in a different town, I wouldn't put the meat and bones in there because it's a lot harder to deal with at home than it is on a large scale farm. So does that help kind of explain commercial versus residential? You're going no. What is harder about putting 
I mean, you have to put hardware cloth under your compost because we have rats. You have to make sure their compost is cooking. But I put anything like, I don't eat meat anymore, but, you know, bones and mm -hmm. any waste from that. I mean, what's harder about it? Well, my composting system was about three months turnover, and bones were not being cooked or cured. So for my particular purposes, it didn't work. So, again, I don't eat meat bones, but I wouldn't have put them in there in the first place because of my way of doing it. And there was somebody at the white shirt as well that had raised her hand. Could you tell me where our trash goes when it leaves here? Yep. So there's three different places that Cape Cod trash goes. Uh, there's uh, New Bedford Waste, or ABC. Uh, that is where the town of Wellfleet's. This might be a Wellfleet specific question. Go. All right. <laughs> uh, so our trash used to go to the CMAS incinerator plant in Rochester, Waste to Energy. They make electric power out of it. That was, a, I believe, a 20 year contract. It was up several years ago. And to, yeah, yes, yeah, 2000, okay. So uh, the town opted to go with ABC Disposal, who is a company that's been around for a while, but they decided to get into the trash business. And they built this facility that was supposed to make our trash into these little briquettes that can then be shipped somewhere else to be used for power. Signed on the dotted line, all ready to go. Before we could bring the first load, the place burned down. So uh, we're still on, on a contract with them. So they had to come up with places for us to go. So for a time, they were sending us to various landfills. And then after that, they made some type of deal with CMAS. And so tomorrow, the load of trash is going to go to CMAS because that's where we're going to. But we're contracted through this other company. I've heard through the grapevine that that facility is finally, maybe several years after the fact, going to open really soon. Um, but that is what's going to happen to our trash. Currently, it's going to the incinerator to be used for power. Hopefully soon it will be going to ABC to do whatever it is that they do with that. But um, generally speaking, it doesn't go to landfills. That's only on very, uh, the exception, I would say. Yes. So what, ha she said, what, what happens, what happens to, to the trash? The so when it, well, it gets burned, yeah, well, it's, it's burned and the heat of that creates the steam to run the turbines to make electric power. Yeah, uh, 75,000 households uh, is powered by that plant. Every day. For better or worse, I have relatives who rent on the Cape, and some of them would like to recycle, but the places that they rent just have general bins. Why is that? Is this in Wellfleet? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I would say that if they're hauling, if they have a, do they have a private hauler to pick it up, or do they just have the landowner take care of it? I think it's a private hauler. I don't, yeah, that, well, there is a, a bylaw in Wellfleet that says you can only have, uh, you can offer trash and recycling at the same rate. You cannot offer trash at the, at a lower price, just trash. So I would look into that a little bit. Okay. But otherwise we do, we do not require a sticker to recycle in Wellfleet. So you can come as a, as a visitor, as long as it's from Wellfleet and you can come to the facility and, and any of the things on that recycle smart flyer, uh, you can get rid of uh, for no fee and no sticker, but that's, that's it. Everything else requires a sticker. I just wanted to clarify about the private hauler answer. Mm -hmm. um, if, if people are using private haulers, um, the private hauler is not taking the garbage to the town to you, right? Uh, no, not, necess not necessarily, and that's because of another bylaw that went in with pay as you throw. And so Wellfleet says, any residential trash, regardless of who picks it up that goes to the transfer station, has to be in purple bags, in those pay-as-you-throw bags. This is not something the haulers were going to do. So uh, generally speaking, the haulers that pick up your trash are taking it to other facilities. Right, and we, so the town doesn't, can't control or enforce any regulations about what's, what the state says can be disposed of, correct? Well, the, the bylaw I was referring to in the previous question is a Wellfleet bylaw. So that would, yeah, it would be a Board of Health regulation. Sorry, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so in order to address a private hauler not being able to either offer recycling or charge less for trash over recycling, the town of Wellfleet put in a bylaw that says that your private haulers picking up trash has to adhere to the waste bans for the state. 
the reason why they're not going to the Wellfleet transfer station after they do that. So it's a bundled service, bundled price. So any private hauler, subscription hauler that operates in the town of Wellfleet has to follow this bylaw. They have to offer both recycling and both trash at the same rate, reflective of both services. So that's how that works. They don't go to the town of Wellfleet's transfer station because that trash being picked up at a curb by a private subscription is not in a purple bag. And that is also a bylaw that says any trash that's collected by the municipal system must be in that purple bag. So those haulers have to take that trash to another venue. How do you know if you're separating trash from recycling? That is on a vendor, and it's, it's, the vendors are the ones that are supposed to put the limitations on the resident to do that. Um, and if somebody has a complaint or it's not happening, they would typically call the Board of Health or the state and there would be an inspection. And also add to that too, the, the waste bin inspections. So any facility that they drop off um, trash and recycling at, much like we do in Wellfleet, um, that, that trash is looked at by the places we drop it off. And if there's a, there's a certain threshold for how much recycling can be in that trash, and if it's too much, they'll reject the load and then cost a lot of money you have to deal with that and the state doesn't like that so wherever they're taking this i would be willing to bet that uh it's i would hope there's not a lot of recycling in it because those facilities would also be in trouble with the state mm -hmm. All right, Richard, yeah. i have a question about the quality of the purple bags why uh, years ago a complaint was made that they would tear before you could get them into your car uh the the ribbon or whatever it is that ties, the ties will fall apart, uh, it, and it leads to leaking in one's automobile, and it's just not a pleasant experience. Why can't a, a, a better product be produced? So the vendor that we use is on our state contract, which could potentially train, uh, change. I'm not sure why this particular, I've heard this from more than one community with pay as you throw and even outside of the Cape because my colleagues talk about this a lot. When I was living in Sandwich, my solution was, and again, I throw out six trash bags a year, is I bought other trash bags to put into the pay as you throw bags to kind of give it that double lining. One of the reasons why they also tear is because we're overstuffing them because we're paying for them. And even though you have to pay for trash bags, like the white ones, you know, or the black ones or whatever trash bags that's not purple um, that belong to your town for this program, we're overstuffing them, so then they're gonna tear anyway. I mean, I can tell you I've torn a glad bag or two here and there. So my, you know, my unfortunate solution, because we don't wanna double up on the plastic, used to be in sandwiches that I just bought regular trash bags and put that regular trash bag into my blue bag for sandwich and then took it to the transfer station. Doesn't that defeat the purpose of the uh, purple bag? No, because you're still, you still have a less, your transfer station sticker is still less than what you would do. You're still green on the map. You're still diverting waste from going into the landfill or to a waste for energy facility. You're still reusing and repurposing and refurbishing and recycling, overthrowing things away. I mean, it's, it's you know, a pain. Um, I've heard that complaint. I don't have an answer to why our vendors' bags are that way. But like I said, it's a state-contracted vendor, and those contracts change over time, and it could be the same vendor or a new vendor. But unfortunately, I've heard that complaint before. Yeah, my solution was to start off with a white bag and then stuff it in the That's what purple. I did. And not that that's like the best solution, but at least it kept my automobile from getting the leachate in it. Or I just didn't put as much trash in it as the bag could hold. Are there any other questions? There's one more. Okay. And we have three prizes. <laughs> um, this may be a little bit off topic, but I've been, uh, speaking of commercial trash, I've been getting more and more concerned about the amount of plastic in the supermarket and the fact that almost everything seems to be encased in plastic now. Yep. Um, and, oh, speaking of the loose vegetables, I found online you can get little mesh bags for vegetables, which I prefer to having loose vegetables, and they're great. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, the cakes are encased in plastic and mm -hmm. vegetables and salad. And uh, is there anything that we can do? I actually went to customer service at Stop and Shop the other day and asked, and yeah. she didn't even realize they had things encased in plastic in their store. <laughs> <laughs> that's how immune we are. <laughs> um, I have this thing called ELA, extreme litter awareness, and I also have a plastic awareness. Um, 
there is, we're coming to a tipping point where you're starting to see plastic free aisles. Um, I just sent the recycling committee, you know, plastic free dental floss because they were talking about it in my car as we were traveling about. Um, but it, it's called EPR or extended producer responsibility. And that's us as citizens putting out to our legislative bodies that we no longer want to use this as an acceptable packaging option. The reason why it's used is it's lightweight and it's cheap and it lasts. Um, and it's quote durable. So because we're doing that and it's lighter weight than other materials and it's less expensive, that's what the producers are using. And there's people out there with the plastic think tanks and you know the Coca-Cola people and everybody else that are advocating for these materials for those specific reasons. Um, but extended producer responsibility starts with us sort of putting our foot down and saying no more. It's in buying power, purchasing power. It's going to our legislative bodies and saying we don't want this anymore. It's passing legislation that says that we want our producers of these materials to either have three different materials that are all recyclable. I just read an article about China. China has, in two years, exponentially grown their plastic to go. And the reason being is um, the Chinese, to order food out, is actually less expensive than going to the grocery store and preparing it, which we're, this is something that's new to us. Uh, for delivery of a full meal to feed three people is the equivalent of one US dollar. And it all comes in plastic. <laughs> so China actually are better recyclers of their plastic than they are. It's at 25% recycled plastic, where the US is less than 10%. And it's because the way we're doing it. It's not because we don't care. It's because we're throwing too much trash in with our recycling. We're contaminating our loads. Okay. But that's what you have to do. It's extended producer responsibility. And us as citizens have to lead the, it's grassroots, we lead the march. All right, I'm, I'm going to um, make an executive decision and say this is going to be our last question, unless there's something pressing that someone has not been able to ask. But we'll go right ahead, please. I've also heard that China is the largest contributor to plastic ocean dumping. They are. 100%. Uh, yep. So I wouldn't give them any medals here. <laughs> uh, and I was kind of wondering, uh, in the United States, are we also contributors to plastic ocean dumping? And who is doing it? Which we is all are. My <laughs> question as to what was happening to our trash. I wanted to know where it was going. Yep. So as far as plastic production, consumption, and disposal, we are actually number third. Uh, we are third in the in the the nation for plastic dumping and producing in generation. Uh, in general, as far as the ocean goes, we're around tenth. <laughs> um, and with China, and again, we're not throwing them any medals, but the reason why they are one of the highest for plastic dumping in the ocean is because they're also dumping our plastic into the ocean that they're not getting or able to recycle. So they're not only taking their own plastic, but they're taking the world's plastic and putting it in the oceans. So just kind of in closing, right uh, you guys know where to find Mike. <laughs> um, I, I, at least I hope all of you do. Um, I like that this was directed by you guys and your questions versus me going over slides that you probably would have enjoyed but didn't really necessarily pertain to this particular conversation. Uh, you can Google me. Uh, you can take one of my cards. Um, I would say your first point of contact with something for the transfer station specific should go to Mike. Um, I do know a lot of the answers for transfer stations because I'm there, I talk to people, I kind of have a general idea of what's being accepted, how they do it, whether it's single stream or source separated. Um, but uh, do you want to go to the last slide real quick? I think my information's on there too, although I think it's tiny. Um, so we have three door prizes left. and because this is Wellfleet and Mike does such an amazing job doing all of this, might I say again. And the recycling committee does an in incredible job of, of staying on topic and you know, staying with the Oyster Fest and you know, the fix-it clinics and, and having people like Chris create our infographics and, and um, really working on private hall regulations and everything else. So um, if anybody wants a card, if anybody wants to talk to Mike, you know where you are. Um, and I'm going to let Mike ask three more questions. If you're going to answer it, please raise your hand so that we can pinpoint who came up first, and then you can answer, take, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. All right, just real quick, because I know everybody wants to get out of here. Uh, I would just like to say thank you for listening. This is not Wellfleet specific. Everybody in the country right now is dealing with this. So I'm doing my best to try to keep us as a town ahead of the game. 
So just bear with me. Another thing to think about is when you're at the supermarket and you see all that plastic, think about what you're buying and think about what that's going to turn into. Because this isn't magic. This, there's only so much that can get recycled. A lot of this stuff just can't be recycled at the moment. So just think about that. Keep that in mind. And thanks for uh, listening to me. Thanks for following the signs. And again, I'm up, I'm up there all the time. Please ask questions. Thank you. So, thank you. Speaking of questions, uh, let's see here. A Capri Sun juice box, you know, for the kids with the aluminum foil, is that recyclable? No. Well, that was the first one. Okay. What's, yeah, and it's, it's yeah, the, that, that type of flimsy foil is no good. Two more questions. Okay. What are the names of the three full-time staff members of the Well-Time Well Food Transfer Station? Mike. Mike. Thank you. <laughs> oh, come on. I couldn't do it without them. Yep. One more? Oh, and that's summer guy. But okay. Yeah. We are very happy to have Bruce. Lenny Summer. I'm surprised nobody picked up on Lenny yet, but he's a summer guy. Okay. Well, it's Jake. Jake is the guy in the scale house. So, all right, now I have to get another question going. Um, well, that, that has changed, right? The caps in the bottle? Okay. Caps on glass bottles. Where do they go? Oh, that, okay, yep, first one. You got it. In the container on the glass table. Nice. Try to keep our glass glass and nothing else. Who had else. that question? Was that then it goes to Dennis and becomes processed glass aggregate. All right, so final question. Let me think about this one. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is a tough one now. I thought I had, pre I had prepared for this. No. One question. Yes. Where would you put, uh, can you recycle shellfish at the transfer station? Oh, Mr. Robichaud. Good job. Well... No, 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 but there, yes, yes, Helen. Correct, that's, that's also true. Uh, but so, food compost, you, I suppose you could, yeah. Correct, there you go. And, and there's, there's a difference here, and I'll tell you why. There, we are recycled shell pile. Uh, if it was super, super clean, it could go in the harbor with the culch. We also have a shellfish culch program. That's a separate pile, though. The reason I don't put the shellfish in the recycled shellfish pile into the harbor is because, much like our recycling, there's a lot of trash in it. There's a lot of U-hooks, uh, there's a lot of plastic bags, there's a lot of things you don't want in your harbor. So what I ended up doing is uh, a lot of artists come in and they take some shells and they make stuff out of it, and then I use it for the roads at the transfer station. So I'm recycling that, but I don't want to put that in the harbor. So we have a whole other pile for that. So I guess you both could get a prize now. You're right. both happy. There right. you go. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. I want to thank everybody. Um, who, who would know that recycling was so fascinating? And uh, there is more to come. And again, uh, the website for this card, but I still am going to give a big push that we get these cards made because they do have a Wellfleet um, section to it. So I think that it would be a good idea if we push the town to make these cards and maybe have them in the library and where you get your beach sticker. Idea. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, thank you, everybody. And I want to thank the Recycling Committee and for our speakers and all of you, uh, even though you were all <laughs> moving out to get to that Bruins game. So as we speak, it's breaking up. Thank you. Mm -hmm.